hope you've enjoyed our January series, uh, Faith and Friendship, and we called it a spiritual pilgrimage looking at the life of Abraham. Uh, today is our last message in the, in the series brought to you by Emma, and I know you're really going to enjoy it. I thank you for, for, for partnering with us, basically, and for us all taking this opportunity to grow our faith and to build our intimacy with God. Well, next week, and we're going to move from this. Next week, we've got Jamie Freeman from the Baptist Association coming in for our Sunday service. And he's going to, they, I mean, talking partnership, the Baptist Association wants to partner with us to reach this city. It's pretty exciting. Jamie is a great guy. He's got a great message. And so I look for, we're looking forward to that. Other things that are happening is that the ministries are back in swing. They're, they're happening. They're moving forward. Our outreaches in our schools will kick off very, very soon. It's just really, really exciting times. We look forward to 2022. We're looking forward to what this year is going to uh, turn into under the leading of the Holy Spirit. So enjoy this message. I hope you've enjoyed your pilgrimage. I hope the daily devotions have been really impacting for you. And let's get together and see the city under the lordship and the leadership and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Enjoy, Emma. Hi, everyone. In the a happy new 2022, I trust that God has great things in store for each one of us and that you're looking forward to a wonderful year ahead. Um, just see this Today, just to continue with the sermon series that we've been looking at in growing in our faith and friendship with God. And I believe that you've really been blessed uh, by the sharings by Mark and Scott and, you know, and Brad and the rest of the team. And I'm just thankful for how God has used them significantly as we begin this year to speak into our lives. And today we are going to be looking further into this uh, area of growing uh, in our faith and friendship with God, and we are going to be looking at credited. Uh, we've been looking at calling, the covenant, the cost, and now today we're just going to be looking at credited. And we're going to be looking at the life of Abraham and how that really speaks to us and the impact that that word credited to him as righteousness has in our lives. But before I go further, let me just pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you because you're so good. We thank you for your goodness and grace. And we thank you that you're so kind that there's nothing that is, you know, in our future that you're not aware of. And even this day, as I share, Lord, I'm, I'm so aware that you have our future and that, Lord, we can walk into it with, with boldness and security and appreciation and freedom because of what Christ has done for us. So this day, I ask, Lord, that you will speak to each one of us, Lord, that you'd open our eyes, uh, the eyes of our hearts, actually, Lord, so that we may understand the things that the Holy Spirit wants us to understand in your, from your word. So we thank you and we, we, we appreciate you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Uh, so we are going to be looking at credited and sort of looking at the life of Abraham because that's what we've been looking at. And uh, Ab Abraham is one of the people that I really, really admire. I really admire him. And I admire what I admire about Abraham is actually his friendship with God. I really admire that. Um, I, want, I, I think I want to be one of those people who are known as a friend of God. I think that's a really, really beautiful invitation that we have there and a great example for us to pursue a relationship and a friendship with our Heavenly Father. You know, and I, when, we, when you read in, uh, in Genesis 18, uh, from verse 16 to 17, uh, I find this very interesting as before we get into the story, uh, in, into credited, I find this very interesting that God actually wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But he says that he can do it without letting Abraham know. You know, when Abraham got visitors, let me just read that verse. Verse 16 of Genesis 18, it says, When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way, because they were leaving uh, his place. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? <laughs> Shall I hide from him? That is how much God considered Abraham a friend. That Abraham's opinion mattered to God. You know, imagine, for example, that God wants to do something in our city and some, I mean, wants to pass judgment on our city. And then he says he can't do it without letting you know. I mean, just, it just really sometimes 
makes me what like God of all, the, the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth says, I can't do this without letting Abraham. I mean, meaning that his opinion mattered to, to, to Abraham's opinion mattered to God. You know, it almost sounds theolo uh, theologically incorrect. Since when did Abraham's opinion begin to matter to God? Uh, and, and, and you know why? It's because we were created for a relationship and God highly valued the relationship that he had with Abraham. You know, we were not created to study God. We were created to be friends of God. Let me just repeat that again. We were not created to study God. We were created to be his friends and to appreciate him and learn of him as we continue to grow in our friendship with him. We were created for love and intimacy. So I believe the reason behind this intimate relationship that God had with Abraham, you know, emanated from Abraham unwavering faith in God. When God said it for Abraham, that settled it. When God said it for Abraham, that was it. And, you know, when we read uh, Genesis uh, chapter 12, uh, we find Abraham is called to, you know, to leave his people and to leave the land that he knew. And then in uh, Genesis 13, we find Abraham separating himself from Lot. And then after that, Abraham, you know, rescues Lot and is actually blessed by Melchizedek, you know, God's great high priest in Genesis 14. And then in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And I'm actually using God Abraham, Abraham interchangeably because in Genesis 15, he's still Abraham. And God makes a covenant with him. And it is in this chapter, chapter 15, where we are told that Abraham, or Abraham actually there, believes and God credited it to him as righteousness. And, uh, and you ask yourself, you know, what did actually Abraham believe? So let's read Genesis 15, uh, verse 1 to 6. The Lord uh, uh, makes a covenant with Abraham. And it, this is what he says. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord. What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up into the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, because he can't. Then he said to him, so shall be your offspring. And then verse 6 says, Abraham believed and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. What did Abraham believe? He believed God's word. It says that the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your hair, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your hair. Abraham believed it. Abraham believed that God had the power to do what he had promised. Promise of a son, his own flesh and blood. He believed that his offspring would be as many as the stars in the sky. He believed, he chose to believe God's word. So he took God at his word and trusted him. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Why is this really significant to us? We find that that verse 6 of Genesis 15 is actually referenced by Paul in Romans 4. And of course, again in James, uh, we find it James chapter 2. In Romans, Paul begins by addressing the issue of sin and righteousness and reminds the church in Rome that we are not justified by the law. We do not overcome our sinful nature by observing the law, but by believing in Christ Jesus. And you know, I, I can try, can you imagine the task that Paul had to convince a people that had lived by performance, that they no longer needed to perform, that, you know, it must have been really, really hard. Think about any change that we've had to deal with in our own lives. You know, how often we autopilot, you know, uh, on many levels, you know. Uh, and I, I guess for the church in Rome and for the, uh, the first uh, century Christians, or no, I don't, I, I, the, the sen you know, the Christians that were the first witness of the, the, the grace, 
Uh, for them, their default nature was just to go back to the law. It's just what you, you're used to doing that. So it was very, you know, default nature, uh, just for them going back to trying to keep the law. But Paul uses the story, you know, of Abraham as a forefather through whom God credited righteousness by faith and not works to try and help the church in Rome and help many churches actually to understand how God credits righteousness to us. So I'm just going to read Romans chapter 4. And we'll sort of look at, at, at it a bit and see what are some of the key lessons that we can learn about the, the fact that God credits righteousness to us, not by law, but by faith. Romans chapter 4 and verse 1, it says that, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. So if you work, then it's an obligation you're paid. It's your, it's your duty. It's what you've done that, you know, you deserve it because of what you've done. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, they are Faith is credited, you know, their faith is credited as righteousness. So David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. And this is what David says, you know, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. So you either live thinking that God, you're obliged to see me or, you know, it's my, I've fulfilled my duty as, you know, and now I'm righteous because of the things that I do. Or you live your life saying, God, I thank you that I'm righteous because I have chosen by faith to believe in what you have done for me through Jesus Christ. So either way you choose, you choose either to live by the Lord constantly, feeling like you have a duty before God, or you thank him that you're righteous because of what Christ has done. Verse 9 says, is, is this blessedness? I love that word. Is this blessedness? Because it's such blessedness. Only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised. We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstance was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? It was not after, but before. It was before Abraham was circumcised that it was credited, his faith in, in God and in his word and in the promise of God, that it was credited to him as righteousness. It is his faith in God and in the promise that God had given him that brought that righteousness to him. So Paul was emphasizing that Abraham was not righteous because he was circumcised. And verse 11 says, and he received circumcision as a sign, as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still circumcised. So circumcision was a sign. It was a seal of righteousness, you know, and we can think about it today when we think about the seal of the spirit of God in us, you know, uh, sort of just thumping and saying, yeah, we belong to God. So then he is the father of all who believed, but have not been circumcised in order that the right, that righteousness might be credited to them. And then he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So he is a father of both the Gentiles and the Jews. So whether you're circumcised, whether you're not circumcised, Paul was saying it is not about that. It's more than that. It's about believing. It's about putting our trust and our faith in God's word and believing what he has said. What a great uh, foreshadow of the things that were yet to come. 
And then uh, he ends by saying in verse 13, it was, not, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For it is those who depend on the law that are heirs. Uh, uh, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless. So for if, sorry, for verse 14, for if those who depend on the law uh, are heirs, then faith means nothing. And the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. That's what the law brings, wrath. It just reminds you of how bad you are, you know. <laughs> but where there is no law, there's no transgression. And we'll look into that a little bit more. And then verse 18 to 23 says this, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through what? Unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power. God had the power to do what he had promised. And this verse 22 says, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Why? Because he believed that God had the power to do what he had promised. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for me and for you to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So Abraham was credited righteousness because he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And God would actually call him, you're my friend. Yeah, you believe what I, you believe me. You believe whatever I tell you, you believe me. I just, so good. So, so good. <laughs> so what are the lessons that we can pick from this? That God only declares people righteous based on their faith in him. Nothing else. Nothing, nothing else. God will declare us righteous as well if by faith we believe in God who delivered Jesus to die for our sins and raised him back to life for our justification. So righteousness is credited to us by God. We don't earn it. It's a gift. Just think about your own life. Every time I think about credited, I imagine of a, a credit card or uh, I don't know when my phone has, uh, uh, you know, I can, I can use my phone to call because it has credit, credit in it. So you believe God and he puts in you his righteousness. He credits righteousness to you. So you're, you're, a, you're, a, you're full of righteousness. The righteousness of God is put in your life, you know. <laughs> It's so good. And, and this is not because we go to church, not because we read the Bible, not because we do good things, you know. And then we have the Holy Spirit as a seal of ownership in our lives. You know, it's because of what God has done through Christ Jesus. And then we can do all the other things, you know. Then we can gather and then we can read God's word and then we can engage in works of obedience, but not starting from the latter going backwards we have to first receive the gift of righteousness that is just that a gift it's so good so how does this actually contribute to our life of faith and friendship with god because we are no longer under the law the bible says there is no transgression i like the verse 15 of romans uh, chapter 4 it says actually maybe 14 for if those who depend on the law are heirs Faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Because why? God has already credited righteousness into us. One of the verses that I really love in the Bible is a verse in Romans and I can't remember quite where, but it says that all the righteous requirements of the law have been met in us through Christ. All, the entire law has been met in us through Christ. Christ. God has credited righteousness in us through Christ Jesus. He did not credit sin. He did not credit guilt or condemnation. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. You know, the Bible says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him 
we might become the righteousness of God. And the Bible also says in 1 John 3, 9, that whoever has been born of God does not sin because God's seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So I want us just to understand a little bit about this, especially around the issue of sin. Uh, you know, the Bible, when it talks about sin, it's often referencing to the idea of missing the mark. When we sin, we miss the mark of righteousness. And when we go before God in repentance, we are repenting because we have missed the mark of righteousness. Because righteousness is already within us. So when we sin against God, it's because we have actually missed. And that's why, you know, and, and John C. talks about that we have the opportunity to go before him and confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us. So sin in our lives, therefore, moves from doing the wrong thing to not doing the right thing. Why? Because we are wired to do the right thing. There's a big difference with I did something wrong with I didn't do the right thing. If my child came to me and said, mom, I did the wrong thing today. I did something wrong to, today. That's one thing. It's another thing if they came and said, I didn't cook because maybe I told them to cook. They were supposed to do that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's be, just being aware of the right thing that you are supposed to do is so important in our journey of faith because it keeps us righteous, conscious, because we are the righteousness of God. And then when, we do, when these things are not done, then we realize that we missed the mark of righteousness that is already within us. Uh, you see, for example, I'm just going to give an example. If you, instead of saying, I'm so impatient, I'm so impatient. Maybe we should say we didn't exercise patience today because we are wired to be patient because we have been credited with patience, which is part of God's righteousness in us. We are wired to be patient. We are wired to be kind. We are wired to be gentle. We are wired to be good. All the fruits of the spirit are within us and we just need to be conscious of that so that we can actually leave them out because the righteousness of God has been credited to us through Jesus Christ. And we grow in these things as, as we mature as God's children. So the word sin in the Bible means missing the mark, uh, missing the mark of righteousness that is already within us. And this one thing really affects how we relate with God. You have no idea how much this affects believers, affects us as children of God. Because how does this affect our faith and friendship with God? When you understand and you, when you and I understand that righteousness has been credited to us by God, we live in freedom. We are free. We are so free. It is for freedom that Christ, you know, died for us. We have the freedom to walk in a trusting, loving relationship with God because God thinks about us as righteous people. There's no fear. He sees me as a righteous being. He sees the son of God in me and he says, oh, this is a righteous being. I can walk with you. I can walk with you because of what Christ has done in you. There's no fear. Absolute freedom. We are not constantly worried of doing the wrong thing. We are not pussyfooting around God. You know, that's not good for any friendship or any relationship, you know. We have no fear because fear has to do with punishment. We are so consumed with doing the right thing. We are so consumed with righteous living. That's what we are consumed about when we wake up in the morning. And even when we, see, we sin against God, we go like, oh, I'm sorry I missed the mark of righteousness. Uh, why, why did I actually do that? You know, I missed the mark of righteousness because I know what I'm supposed to do. I already know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and we miss those marks sometimes. But it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We will not allow ourselves by the grace of God to be yoked into slavery because we are no longer under the law trying to live by works. That is a lie. We are no longer living by works. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is freedom. When we can best exercise our faith in an atmosphere of freedom. Faith and friendship. 
uh, you know, faith is best exercised in an atmosphere of freedom. And that's exactly what has God has given us. There are no fears around him. So you can, you can go, you can go crazy. You can, you can, you know, you can obey God with a lot of freedom. And our faith and friendship with God requires that atmosphere. And that's what God has actually given to us. So that's number one, we can live in freedom. Number two, we can walk in confidence. God has done the work for us in and through Christ. He knew we can't match his standard of holiness. So he gave us a way out and we only need to believe. He gave us a way out. Confidence in approaching God. The Bible says in Hebrew 4.16, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of our need. Confidence is a key ingredient to a life of faith and friendship. When we have confidence, we, are not, we not only have the boldness to approach God, but we have the confidence to ask for audacious things. We are confident people before God. He's done it for us. He loves us. You know, and in Genesis, Chapter 18, verse 16 to 17, uh, where we read earlier, you know, after God tells Abraham what he was going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, God said, I can't do this thing. I need to first of all check, check it out with my friend Abraham. So God actually does this. And then we see Abraham really pushing it. <laughs> oh, he was such a good friend of God. He really pushed it. He, he was audacious before God. And, and, you know, it says in verse 25 of Genesis 18, this is what Abraham actually really tells God. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right. Every time I read that part, I wonder, who questions God? Far be it far from you to do such a thing. Huh? To kill the righteous and the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. That was Abraham's response to God. Far, far be it from you, Lord. Will not the judge of the earth, judge of all the earth, do the right thing? Like who questions God? Who talks to God like that? Only a confident friend. Only a friend of God can actually ask him those questions. Why do you want to do this? Can't you reconsider? Can't you? And because we were born for relationship with God, that's where he wants us to get to. You know, to reason with him. He wants, he wants us to appreciate him as a father and as a friend. And yes, he is a judge, but he wants us to have relationship with him. That's why he created us for community. And number three, so we talked about freedom. We've talked about uh, confidence. And then the third thing is we can keep on believing. Believing in Jesus as a son of the living God credits righteousness to us. It is the beginning of a great journey with God. Please note the most important but only the beginning. Believing in Jesus is the most important, but only the beginning. Unfortunately, most of us end there. We believe in Jesus and it ends there. We take on that promise, but we discard the rest of the promises of God. We believe this great truth, which is fantastic, but then we believe lies in all the other areas of our lives. We believe that Jesus died for us. Yes. We believe he rose from the dead. Yes. We believe we are going to heaven. Yes. We believe we will see Jesus one day. Yes. But then we believe lies in so many other areas of our lives. Let me put it this way. Often we attain our deliverance from Egypt, but we never believe that we can ever cross to the promised land. So we say, thank you for your deliverance, Lord. I will take it up from here. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for, for dying for me. Thank you for righteousness. But from now on, I'll take it up from here. I love 1 Peter 2, 3. It says this. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through them, 
through the promises that he's given us, we may participate in his divine nature. There is more. There is more. There are promises that God has given us so that we can participate in his divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. There are many promises to believe and we can keep on believing because God has credited righteousness to us. We believed in that and he credited righteousness to us. We can believe in all the other promises. We don't have to leave the other areas of our lives full of lies. God wants us not only to become his, which is really great, but he wants us to participate in becoming more and more like him. And that's how we grow in our friendship with him. And the more and more we grow uh, to become like him, the more we get to influence like he would. Because then we get to participate in his divine nature and we get to live his divine nature. And that's how we become witnesses. You and I are the witness when we begin to live the divine nature of God as we continue to believe in his promises. He wants us to be carriers of his divine nature. So how will 2022 look for you? How will it look for you? What you've always said that was that we want to grow in our faith and friendship with God this year. What if all we wanted to do this year was to grow in our faith and friendship with God? The question is, what would change in your weekly schedule? How would your week look like if what you want to do this year is grow in your faith and friendship with God? Would it look like more time in prayer, more time in devotion, more time in the word, more time meditating and believing God's promise? Would it look like more freedom in your life? My challenge to us, I guess, as we begin the year 2022, let's just ask God to help us to be his friends. Let's ask God to help us to be his friends. Let's look at our weekly schedule and ask God, how is my schedule helping me grow in my friendship with God? How are we using our time to grow in our friendship with God? I love Abraham. He is one person that is worth studying. And I'm so glad that we've started this month of January looking at the life of Abraham. He's a man of faith. You and I are here today because he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then he became the father that reconciled both the Gentiles and the Jews together because he believed way before the circumcision. And then we can talk about him today and then we can begin to ask God. We want that. Now think about it. One of the things that really, really challenges me about Abraham is that he was actually able to believe in a time when grace was not so available. You know, so to say, so to speak, but think about Christ has come. We are in a different dispensation now, the dispensation of grace and truth. How much more? We can really be God's friends and we can add it. Friends plus, if you want to say so. So I pray that all of us have a really wonderful 2022 and yeah, let's grow in our faith and friendship with God. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for all that we can learn from your friend Abraham. And Father, I ask of you, Lord, just give us a heart that pursues you relentlessly. Just give, give us a heart that discards, you know, just the, the just trying to look like we are your friends, Lord, but really desiring and truly pursuing not just the form of friendship, which the Bible says is a form of godliness, but the power that comes through having a true friendship and an intimate relationship with you, Lord. So I thank you, God, and I thank you for each and every person listening, Lord. Father, I ask God that you would bless them this year. I pray, Lord, that they would desire and have such a passionate longing to want to know you and to grow intimately uh, in, your, in their relationship with you, Lord. Speak a blessing over each family, over each and every person. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. <music>